we started with the Lord's Prayer a few weeks ago, and then uh, I reminded us that there's an acronym that saints have been using for a long time to kind of structure their prayer, and that acronym is ACTS, A-C-T-S, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. Again, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. And one pastor or uh, theologian even commented once quite comically that uh, we often rearrange those letters of Acts into scat. And we start with our needs first and then get around to thanking God at the back end. So I think it's good that we keep the order Acts, adoration. We thank God for who he is without any mention of what he's done even necessarily, just who he is and how great our God is. And then we come before him realizing how, how much we need to confess. And last week we focused on confession. Luther says life is about confession. All of our life is an act of confession. <clears throat> and today we, we turn to thanksgiving. Because after having confessed and received the grace of the Lord, how can we not be thankful? How can we not give thanks to God? Well, let's stand together. If you would, we're going to read from Psalm 107. And I'll try to make these instructions clear. You'll notice that there's some text of Psalm 107 that is both bold and highlighted. For example, verse one. Those are the texts I would like you to read out loud with me. So those will be our congregational, if you will, uh, out loud reading verses. And we'll have several of them. And you'll notice the refrain. You'll see why we're doing this here once we go through it. So Psalm 107, uh, I don't recall the page in your pew Bibles, but Psalm 107, let's read God wor God's word. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted with them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he will fill with good things. Verse 10, some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons, for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts in two the bars of iron. Some were foolish through their sinful ways and because of their iniquities suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love for his wondrous works to the children of man, and let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds and songs of joy. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in his deep, for he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. He turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste. Because of the evil of its inhabitants, he turns a desert into pools of water and parched land into springs of water. And there he lets the hungry dwell and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. 
by his blessing, they multiply greatly. And he does not let their livestock diminish. Almost there. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, evil, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trackless wastes. But he raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks. The upright see it and are glad, and all wickedness shuts its mouth. Read this last verse with me. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let him consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, your word is good. It endures forever. Give us hearts that are moldable. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And teach us to be a thankful people. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. It was a long psalm, but it's worth it. Our Psalm 107 begins the fifth book of the Psalms. The book of Psalms, all 150 are divided into fifth books, and so this is the anchor for the fifth and final book of the Psalms. Verses one through three and verses 43 serve as bookends, bookends to remind us and call us to thanksgiving. The Psalm is a poem and it moves in its opening verses of thanksgiving and then carries us through four scenes or scenarios. And maybe you noticed that each of those scenes or scenarios has a refrain. That was the part that we read out loud together. A two-part refrain. And packed in between that refrain is God's deliverance. Packed in between, and we'll notice that each time we go through it is what he has done for his people there. Some authors think that this psalm is actually the third of a kind of a triplet of psalms. And this is the final psalm, having seen God's work in calling a people and then their lament that their sin has caused them to suffer. And now we have a psalm of deliverance, a psalm of thanksgiving. Well, let's turn our attention to verses 1 through 3. Psalm 107, verse 1 through 3. The psalmist, whom only God knows by name, writes, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands and from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. So those of us who know our Old Testament history here quickly realize this psalm is not only about circumstances that we individually find ourselves in, but it's also about the circumstances that Israel had found themselves in, being captive and deported to Babylon. And so this psalm is a psalm of thanksgiving of that return from captivity to Jerusalem. But it is also a personal psalm. A psalmist is writing this and gives us, as I said, four scenarios of experiences that any one of us could experience. The anchor to this psalmist's thanksgiving is the Lord's steadfast love. Last week we talked a little bit about this. I could do a sermon on just this one word in the Hebrew text. Steadfast love is that special love that God has for his covenant people. His special love that a father has for his children. It is not vague or impersonal. Rather, it is personal, and it is steadfast. God's love never wanes, never grows tired. He never forgets his commitments to his covenant people, his children, or in our day and age, the church, those who are in Jesus Christ. So the psalmist's thanksgiving is anchored firmly in God's steadfast love, and not in the psalmist's circumstances, not in the psalmist's circumstances, as we will see shortly. Episode or scenario number one, starting in verse four. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted with them. So here we have the scenario. Some have wandered, some are lost. Now, maybe they're physically lost, stranded in the wilderness. My brother and I hiked the Grand Canyon some years ago and we learned on that very hot day, it was over 100 at the top of the canyon, so the base of, you know, by the river was brutal. We learned that the most common 
fatality age range is 20-year-olds. It's 20-year-olds. They wander and they're cocky and they get lost and separated. They make the mistake of not bringing the proper tools, that is water typically, and then one, they decide, let's split up to get help, and one of them passes away. It's not the 30-year-olds or the 40-year-olds or the 60-year-olds. They have wisdom, but it's the young bucks. Here we have a picture of someone lost, someone wandering, someone separated from the flock. No city, no safety, hungry, thirsty, and their soul, their very soul, their spirit is just devastated and fainting. And then the refrain that you and I read together, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. Well, what did he do? Verse seven, remember what I said, the, the deliverance is packed in between those two common refrains. What did he do? Verse seven, he led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. They led them by a straight way till it, he reached a city, a safe city to dwell in. So this is what God has done. Not only for the person who's lost, that was us at some point, right? Before Jesus, we were lost, wandering, wondering what our purpose is in life, roads that wind, and we're not sure which way we're going, which way's up. He, the Lord Jesus, gave us a straight way to him. Reminds me of Isaiah chapter 40, right? John, the harbinger, the straight way to the Lord. <clears throat> or the Israelites, They've been banished, taken out of their capital of Jerusalem, the city of the Lord, Zion, and they're in Babylon, wicked, evil, idolatrous Babylon, and he has now returned them to Jerusalem. Verse 8, what's their response then? Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men. And how do they thank him more particularly in this circumstance? For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. You've experienced that, haven't you? You've wandered towards sin, or you weren't even in Christ. You were outside of Christ, and you tried to fill that hole in your heart with everything, and nothing worked. Relationships, pleasure, job, career, and nothing filled that, that, that soul, that, that, that anxiousness, that wandering, that sense of, I don't know what, I, what value I have here. Or what am I doing? And you found in Christ that he satisfies your soul. And the hungry soul he fills with good things. That's something, brothers and sisters, that we can be thankful for. Consider this week, just making that part of your prayer this week. Lord, I thank you for satisfying my soul in Jesus. Scenario two, verse 10. Now we've moved from wandering to darkness. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons. And they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. You can see in this day and age what that might look like with just a little bit of imagination. It's that son or daughter who knows the truth of the scriptures, who's heard of the gospel but has gone down a foolish path. They've rebelled, verse 11, against the words of the, of the Lord. They've spurned the counsel of God. So what does God do? God bows their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. God allows their decisions to bring circumstances that bow them. And I, can, I know there are parents right now who are seeing their children go through this. And I am sorry that you've had to see them suffer through their sin and the hardship that they've put on themselves through their decisions. But friends, there is hope. Don't give up hope. Look at what we're going to pray for that son or daughter, verse 13, that they would say this, that they would cry out to the Lord in their trouble and that he would deliver them from their distress. Verse 14, he brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Well, this is the testimony of anyone who struggled with addiction. You always hear language of chains, of being bound, of just feeling like a slave, like you can't help but go back to whatever that addiction might be, whether it's alcohol or drugs or 
pornography or success. And God, and only God, can break those chains. Only our Lord can bring us freedom from that addiction, nothing else. And notice the response then. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. And more particularly, why? Because he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts in two the bars of iron. These are the testimonies, friends, that we who, are in, who have grown up in the church love to hear. Because our testimonies, and I hope many of our testimonies, are rather boring in a sense. I knew the Lord at a young age and I've walked with him all my life. That's a great testimony. Don't be ashamed of that. But we do tend to gravitate toward these testimonies that are of deliverance from addiction, a deliverance from a gang lifestyle, a deliverance from prostitution. And God gets all the praise and all the more praise because of that. But young believer, don't think that a life of foolishness is worth it. It's not something we want to aspire to, a dramatic testimony. It shouldn't be on your top 10 lists. It shouldn't be on your bucket list. Scenario three, first wandering, darkness, and some were fools with their sinful ways. And because of their iniquity, suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Here, the same idea, just a little bit more intimately put together. If the second scenario looks a little bit more like Israelites coming from their captivity in Babylon to Israel, this is definitely now an image of that person who has done something foolish and is now reaping their, their rewards, if you will, to the point of death, not just imprisonment, but death. They're on death's doorstep. And what does God do in verse 20? He sent out his word. He answered their prayer and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. He sent out his word and he healed them and delivered them from destruction. My theology allows for healing. I have never seen it personally, but I have heard testimonies of men and women of children healed in dramatic fashion. I can think of one pastor who, who's a, a mentor of sorts from a distance, and he saw this firsthand in the Jesus movement back in the 70s. He saw in that kind of departure of the culture and diving into drugs, he saw people just delivered without any sense of, of harm from the drugs that, that had enthralled them. God can do that, friends. I don't think he does it very often anymore, it seems, in my experience, but he does it. And he does it for his glory. And notice their response, the refrain that we've been saying over and over again. They gave thanks to the Lord for what? His steadfast love, for his wondrous works. And what are those works? And what is their response? They gave up sacrifices of thanksgiving, and they tell others of his deeds in songs <laughs> Of joy. I mentioned last week how much I love the website I Am Second. It's a, it's a website of dramatic testimonies. Some of very famous people. People you know from sports, from the musical theater, from movies, from just general fame. <clears throat> They're powerful. If you need an encouragement this week, hop on. But again, be warned, there are some pretty serious testimonies. It's not for the younger uh, audience. Our fourth scenario. So we've moved from wandering in the desert to being imprisoned to suffering from our foolish decisions to being on a ship. Some went down to the sea in ships doing business in the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men, and they were at their wit's end. What a picture the poet and the psalmist has painted. It reminds me of the Cape Horn, where you have three oceans that meet. There's a tiny little book. The title is My Old Man in the Sea. It's a playoff of Hemingway's book, The Old Man in the Sea. And it's a story of a father and son, true story, who take a single sail, uh, I don't think it was even a 30-foot sail, around the horn. They break the world record at that point for the smallest sail to go around the horn. And they talk of swells that could be up to 40 feet. Up to 40 feet in a little boat. 
I think I'd lose my cookies too. That's what they're talking about here. The psalmist is in that or is describing someone he knows who's been through that. They've been on that ship and God's commanded the winds and the waves and it doesn't look like anybody's going to survive this. They mounted up to heavens, he describes, and went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight and they reeled like drunken men, right? Who wouldn't in waves that are that big? Reminds me of the Gospels. You remember when the disciples are on the Sea of Galilee and Kent, who's been there, and others of you who have been there know that the, because of the, the geography of that land, the wind can really come down onto that lake and stir up quite a, quite a, squ- quite a swell of waves, quite a storm. So here, they're crying out. And what does the Lord do? What does the Lord do? They cry out, <clears throat> and he delivers them. Notice verse 29. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. So God stills the storm and brings them into a safe harbor. And what do they do? They respond. They respond thanking the Lord for his love and for his works. And notice then the final verse of this Part, verse 32, let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. It's another reminder for us, especially if you are an older generation, which means you have kids or grandkids, share your stories of God's work in your life with those whom you're raising, children, grandchildren. Share your stories of the hard times. Share your stories of the waves of the foolishness and the decisions you made and how God delivered you from them, from addictions, from imprisonments, from being lost to being found. Share your stories. Share them. Kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, nephews, nieces, co-workers, friends, neighbors, share. Your story is powerful. Your story, your story is your own. Share your stories and watch what God does. You may not see it immediately, but I think if you and I can think back, there are some very formative stories of faith that we heard from our parents or from other members in the church that impacted us and stuck with us. Those stories tend to stick like songs. They tend to stick with us longer than sermons for sure. Well, here we've seen four episodes Four different ways in which God has delivered his people and which they've responded with what? Thanksgiving. The last part of our psalm then turns away from focusing on people and and deliverance to God's sovereignty over our circumstances. We're going to walk through this uh, quickly and then I'm going to ask for Kim Schmicke to come up and share us our final testimony, our final scenario. He turns rivers, that is the Lord, into a desert. He springs of water into thirsty ground, a beautiful land into a salty waste because of the evil of its inhabitants. He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water, and there he lets the hungry dwell and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield by his blessing. They greatly multiply and he does not let their livestock diminish. So here we see God's sovereignty over the circumstances. He is the one who turns rivers into desert, springs of water into thirsty ground. He brings hardships. And sometimes we have no idea why. In this circumstance, it seems to be because of verse 34, because of the evil of its inhabitants. So sometimes our circumstances, friends, are just a fault of our choices or of the choices of others around us. We live in a broken world, in a broken land. And sometimes our circumstances are just because of the broken creation that we live in. While it was made good and whole, sin has shattered that wholeness and that goodness so they could never be fully tasted. And yet notice the hope here. He turns a desert into pools of water and a parched land into springs of water. So while God is on the hook for the hardships in our life and often Those are what I hear about as a pastor. Or when I share my faith with friends, they say, where was God when this hard thing happened? 
how could God allow this to me to happen to me or to my wife or to my family? And I don't have answers directly because who knows the mind of God and his mysterious ways? But I know his goodness. And so I remind them of this other part. That is to say, friends, if God is on the hook for the bad stuff, then he's also on hook for the good stuff. Again, let me say that again. If God's on the hook for the bad circumstances in our life, well, then he's also logically on the hook for all the good stuff. So he's on the hook for when you were in a car accident and you should have died, but you didn't. He's on the hook for the miracle of your marriage when you didn't deserve that woman or husband sitting next to you. So remember that in your own life and when you share your faith. God's on the hook for both. He's sovereign over all things. And at his core, his steadfast love never fails for his people. So notice his caring of the hungry here in verse 36. Notice how he brings the crops to a fruitful yield in 37. And notice his blessing on the livestock. Notice his blessings. Last portion here. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, evil, and sorrow, the Lord pours contempt on princes or insert bosses or insert politicians that are corrupt. He pours contempt on them and makes them wander in trackless wastes, just like the first example. And he raises up the needy out of the affliction and makes their families like flocks. The upright see it and are glad, and all wickedness shuts its mouth. How often has history told this tale that while the unjust leaders rule for a bit, in the end, they meet their fate, and the righteous see God work in ways that close the mouth of those who were celebrating in their wickedness. So our Father in heaven and his Son, our Lord Jesus, and the the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, testify to God's steadfast love in our lives. Many of us here have testimonies. We've read through four of them. And now I want to bring a dear sister up. Kim, come on up. Kim Schmicke, I'm going to have her introduce herself here real quick. And I were meeting a couple weeks ago, maybe it was a month ago, and I was just asking her about her story because it's my habit. So you must know if I get to meet you, I'm going to ask you about your story. I love to hear how people got here because I feel like then I get to know them. And I knew that Kim had been through not one or two or three, but 19 surgeries on her jaw. And I asked her kind of something along the lines of, and it wasn't anything profound, I probably just asked her, well, you know, how, how have you gotten through that? And her first words were thankfulness. And so when I thought, I heard that, and I thought, we have a sermon coming up on this. And I wanted to hear, and I wanted you to hear some of Kim's words. So hi, Kim. Hi. <laughs> um, anything you, else you want to introduce about yourself before we ask you a couple of questions? No, nope, you did good. All right, very good. All right, first question I wanted to ask Kim, um, how has staying thankful helped you? through your journey of all these different jaw surgeries? Well, um, I have it written down just so I don't forget things. When I think about being thankful, it truly is and has been a journey. Some days are really difficult and I struggle, but during those times are when I really cry out to God and I express my heart to Him and I just ask Him for strength. At other times, it seems that God brings somebody into my path just to encourage me, to give me a hug, maybe bring something over, or just make me laugh. There's so many times when God just puts something in in my pathway and I just laugh. Whether it's a quiet time with God or He uses somebody in my life, He shows me that He loves me and He cares for me. As I do try to keep a thankful heart, it helps me to keep my eyes on him in every working situation. What have you learned, Kim, about the Lord? And kind of, you know, how has your heart been helped? And, and thinking more particularly, you know, what have you learned that you would, because I know, I know Kim, I know her heart is to take what she's learned and to share it with somebody else. So what are some of those things when you think of 
brothers and sisters, young or old here, who are going through hardships. What, what have you learned that you'd like to share that you think would be beneficial? Well, I'm continually learning um, that God is faithful and that he cares about me in every situation, from the smallest detail to travel arrangements and even finding the right doctor. And one of the things I'm learning is to not miss those day-to-day -day things that God is doing in my life. Sometimes I'm looking for that miracle, and then that's when I miss what's right before my eyes, such as giving me a great job that is supportive and works with me with my doctor's appointments, surgery, and even recovery. Or how he has used people to stop by and check up on me, bring a meal, or just give me a hug. After a recent surgery, a, a friend called and had said, we're coming over, and instead of bringing food, we're all bringing a smoothie, because they knew that's all I could eat. <laughs> and when I think of that time, I just laugh, because it was just so much fun and such a joy. And I think laughter is one of the best medicines we can have. I think through the past, years of dealing with these surgeries, and I'm learning that God is always there in control, and then I need to let go and to trust. No matter what I'm going through, I would have to say that it take, that I would say that spending time with God is the best thing. Kim, um, <clears throat> there's probably nothing harder than to suffer alone. You and Mark have been here for almost 10 years, is that right? Eight. Eight years? Okay. Um, how, how has the church helped you in, this, in the process of, of through, your, through your surgeries and through your experience to be thankful? And yeah, Anything come to mind? I couldn't have done it without the church, period. I mean, it's the church who has gathered around us and supported us and given us strength. Um, they've cleaned our house. They've made us meals. They've, when our kids were small, they watched our kids. And one particular thing, they even ironed our clothes. <laughs> and there's a story behind that, but I'll leave it at that. But more recently, um, the surgery that I had in March, we were so encouraged and loved by this church family, by all the prayers, the calls, the texts, the notes, the emails, and even the ice cream. This family really is a blessing. Um, the love and action that has it, we have experienced through these people and this family um, leads us to just thank God for all of you and to have a really thankful heart. But through that, I would encourage everyone here to get involved in a small group because it's through the small groups that you get to know people and that they can learn your heart and your needs and just live and grow with you. Would you be willing to tell that ironing story, Kim? <laughs> sure. When we were in Alexandria, um, Mark was working at Target and he had to have his pants ironed and his shirt ironed. and. Um, a gal came and said, I'll do whatever you need. And so I said, well, I really need Mark's clothes ironed. So she didn't say a word. She took them all, and she went home, and she ironed them. And it was weeks, maybe a month later, I found out she hates ironing. <laughs> but she sacrificially ironed all of Mark's clothes, never said a word. So to me, that was just such a blessing. Yeah, something to be thankful for. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Kim. Let's give her a round of applause. There's such power in our stories. There is such power when we share what God's done in our lives. Thank you, Kim. It's not easy to come up here and share your testimony. Um, I'm proud of Kim for doing that and thankful for her. And I hope that something she has said has blessed you and reminded you of something either you can be thankful for or a way that you can help someone else. Um, 
yeah, there's more I could say there, but I'm very thankful for Kim and Mark. Um, and if you haven't gotten to know them, um, they're right. A small group is a phenomenal way to get to know them or other people. This fall, we'll be launching small groups uh, during our series on the book of Colossians. So everyone here will have a chance to join a, a group of like-minded believers from all different walks and shapes and sizes for eight to ten weeks to share life together, to, to gather together for, for study, for prayer, for food, for some fun, and even, a, even some type of mission project or service project. I can't wait to lead a group. I can't wait for my wife and our kids to be back in a group. We love small groups. I hope you'll make that a priority this fall. We'll be announcing more of that here uh, come September, but I hope that sticks with you this week. <clears throat> Let's close with verse 43. Whoever is wise, the psalmist writes, let him attend to these things. Let me repeat that again. Whoever is wise, let him or her attend to these things. What things will all that the psalmist have been writing about? Particularly the following second half of the verse. Let them consider or know personally, not just cognitively mull it over like, oh, that's kind of a good option, but to consider, to know the steadfast love of the Lord. And that is a love that everyone here who knows it is thankful for. Let us pray and prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. Father, thank you. Thank you. We sang that beautiful song today, Jesus, thank you. Father, we thank you for sending your son. We thank you for your spirit's work within those who are in your son. We thank you for Kim's testimony of her encouragement for us to be thankful and to, to be involved in one another's lives. Thank you for the various testimonies in this room. Thank you for the power they've had on, on many of us. Give us boldness this week and the weeks to come to share our, our stories with our families, with our children and our grandchildren. Help us to be quick to give you thanks and to praise. Help us be quick to testify to what you've done. And for those of us who are struggling right now, who are in the thick of it, and it's hard to be thankful, and we're doubting your steadfast love. Holy Spirit, please give us the faith that we lack. Comfort us in the ways you promise in Romans and elsewhere where it says even if we cannot mutter the words that you are praying on our behalf, Spirit. Thank you for your work. And thank you for this chance to celebrate your work in the taking of the Lord's Supper. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.